All right, is it okay if we go ahead and get started? All right, hi everyone, my name is Betty. Um, later on, Jessica and Upala will also be joining us. Um, we're all dietetic interns from Stony Brook University. And we're really excited to be able to talk to you today about food and exercise recommendations for diabetes. Um, November is National Diabetes Month, so it's the perfect time to be having this discussion. So we're able to speak with you today um, because we're part of Stony Brook Medicine's Healthy Libraries Program, which is a program designed with public health, nursing, nutrition, and social work students. And our main purpose really is to share the knowledge that we learn with all of you, and it's in conjunction with Suffolk County Libraries. Left, you can. Great. Okay. So this is just the learning objectives, um, kind of our goals for what um, you'll be able to do by the end of the presentation. And the first is to identify the normal range for blood sugars, understand the health effects of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes, you know, really learn ways to manage prediabetes and type 2 diabetes with healthy diet and exercise, to be able to understand what kind of foods have the biggest impact on blood glucose levels, and also to be able to identify good quality carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and also to be able to read a food label and identify appropriate serving sizes. So if you have a question at any point during the presentation, we encourage you to put it in the chat box. We kindly ask that you stay muted just for the duration, just so that we eliminate any background noise. But if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we will address them later on during the Q&A session. So what is diabetes? Diabetes is a chronic disease characterized by elevated blood sugar levels. So there are many different types and there's also something known as prediabetes, which is when your blood sugar levels are higher than normal, but they're still not quite high enough to be diagnosed as diabetes yet. And so some of the types of diabetes are type one, type two, and gestational diabetes. Type one diabetes is an autoimmune disease where um, it's typically diagnosed during childhood and your younger years, whereas type two diabetes is typically diagnosed later in life, and it's the most common form. Type two is the most common form. Gestational diabetes occurs when di diabetes is diagnosed during pregnancy. And so for the sake of time today, we'll mostly be focusing on prediabetes and type two diabetes. So uncontrolled diabetes can affect virtually all parts of our bodies. It can affect our brains, our hearts, our feet, our kidneys. It can affect our blood flow and it also can affect our eyes. So this is really why we care and why we should do our best to either prevent getting diabetes or to prevent symptoms from getting worse. And so the great news is that with healthy diet and exercise, we can really manage these symptoms and prevent you know, further complications. So what are some of the risk factors? Overweight obesity, high blood pressure, poor diet, physical inactivity, and also family history plays a role. So as of 2017, I believe there was a statistic that 50% of males and 70% of females with diabetes were also obese. So there is a strong link between the two. And so what are some of the symptoms? Um, typically, the most presenting symptom is hyperglycemia, which is high blood sugar. And some symptoms may be frequent urination, feeling very thirsty or hungry. Maybe you have blurred vision, tingling or numbness in the hands or feet. And so then the opposite of hyperglycemia is hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar, and it can be very dangerous. And symptoms of this may include sweating, dizziness, feeling nervous, anxious or irritable, maybe feeling confused, having a rapid heart rate, and also feeling hungry. So how is it diagnosed? So there are two, two measures we use, A1C and FPG, which are routine lab checks. And A1C is a measure of your blood sugar levels over a period of about three months. FPG stands for fasting plasma glucose, which is essentially a one-time reading of blood sugar when you haven't eaten anything for about eight hours. So normal A1C level is typically below 5.7%. For prediabetes, it's typically between 5.7 and 
For diabetes, it's typically 6.5 or higher. For fasting plasma glucose, that one-time reading, a normal reading would be below 100. For prediabetes, it would be between 100 and 125. And for diabetes diagnosis, it would typically be 126 or higher. So this is a great chart here, which shows us the relationship between the A1C level and glucose levels. So the A1C is in a percentage. So for example, if you have a newly diagnosed individual with diabetes, maybe their A1C is 11%. That is equivalent to about 300 glucose level. So if you remember, we had mentioned a fasting plasma glucose less than 100 is considered normal. So if you have an A1C of 11%, your glucose could be even three times higher than the normal range at times. So here's a great chart which shows us our, what happens with our blood sugars after we eat a meal. And the three lines coincide with a normal individual, someone with prediabetes, and then the last all the way on the top, the green line is an individual with diabetes. So as you can see from the green line, before they eat a meal, the blood sugar is already higher than the other two. And after they eat a meal, their blood sugar rises, rises, rises. It goes very high, even over 350. And then it very slowly comes back down. So even after hours after eating a meal, your sugar levels are still pretty high compared to the normal and the prediabetes. So prediabetes, as we had mentioned earlier, is when your blood sugars are higher than normal, but they're still too low to be considered a diabetes diagnosis. And that's again, like with the fasting blood sugar level of 100 to 125. And so people with prediabetes may feel fine and not have any symptoms. So it's really important and we encourage everyone to go to the doctor every year for your annual checkup. And prediabetes can become type two diabetes if blood sugars are not controlled. So again, as we've mentioned, healthy diet and exercise can reduce the risk of developing type 2 diabetes, which we'll really focus on later during this presentation. So type 2 diabetes is when you have a fasting blood sugar greater than 125. And really what happens here is that the cells of the body don't properly use the blood sugar because of something called insulin resistance. So some people may be prescribed medications like metformin or insulin by their doctor for this reason. So what is insulin? Insulin is a hormone produced by one of our organs called the pancreas, and it helps body cells absorb glucose. So this diagram here shows a healthy individual in the process of when we eat foods with carbohydrates in them, like bread, pasta, fruits, or sodas, our body converts the carbohydrates in the food to sugar. So as a result, our blood sugars rise. The reason our blood sugars stimulates our pancreas to start producing insulin. So insulin then will be released into the bloodstream and it acts on the cells to help our cells absorb the glucose from the blood and enter the cells so we can use the sugar for fuel. However, when we have insulin resistance, as commonly seen with type 2 diabetes, we may have a high carbohydrate diet, which leads to higher sugar levels, which then triggers a release of insulin from the pancreas. However, with insulin resistance, our cells aren't really responding to that insulin. So as a result, we have a lot of insulin in our blood and we have a lot of glucose in our blood and we're not really able to use it. And sometimes when we have extra insulin and extra glucose, the extra gets stored as fat, which is why we may see a connection between obesity and diabetes as well. So now that we know the connection between food and our blood sugars, I'm gonna pass it off to Upala to speak a little bit about what we should be eating. Yeah, hi. So a healthy meal plan for people with diabetes is generally the same as healthy eating plan for anyone else. That includes, that is low in sugar, low in saturated and trans fats, moderate in salts with meals based on lean protein, non-starchy vegetables, whole grains, and healthy fats. So this picture, the bull's eye 
food guide is what we are going to go over. I'll go through it, all the sections. So the green section is what we are going to focus on, the foods for each category. In the green section, they were selected as the go-to foods because they are the most nutrient dense. They contain the most vitamins and minerals, antioxidants, fiber, while also containing the least amount of sugar, sodium, and fat in them. Now the section, the food that falls in the yellow section are the okay foods because they are still providing you with nutrients, but they are just not as ideal as the green section. They may have some added sugar, sodium, or unhealthy fats compared to those in the green section. So it's okay to eat these once in a while. Now the food that falls in the red section in the Bullseye Food Guide is what we call stop and think foods. So when you go through your day, try to notice how many times are you selecting foods from this section and literally stop and think, do I really need this food item now, or can I replace it with something from the green or even the yellow section? The foods that fall into this category should be limited only because they are, they are the least healthy option. And they provide you with minimal nutrients and have the highest amounts of sugar, the added sugar, and the sodium and unhealthy fat. Um, so let's go over the same section, the carbohydrate section from um, the uh, guide. All these contribute to the carbohydrate, the whole grains, starches, starchy vegetables, fresh and frozen fruits, the low fat milk and yogurt, even that contains carbohydrates plus this uh, sodium, I mean the protein. So contrary to the popular belief, People with diabetes do not have to avoid carbohydrate containing foods, such as bread, rice, starchy vegetables, fruits, and desserts. Some of these foods, especially whole fruits and whole grains, are rich sources of fiber, which play a vital role in uh, blood sugar control and heart health. So the key is to eat mostly unprocessed carbohydrate containing foods with lean proteins and healthy fats in quantities that facilitate weight loss and blood sugar control. All these are important part of the diet. And if you choose from the green section in the bullseye um, guide, you are uh, choosing the good quality carbs. That is the whole grains, starches, starchy vegetables like the potatoes, the parsnip, the winter squash, peas, they are all considered starches. So even though they are vegetables, they are starches and will raise your blood sugar if you eat too much of them. So in this case, the portion size is very important. Fresh, whole fruit or frozen, you avoid fruits that are soaked in syrup. So fruits are a great source of fiber and antioxidants. And even the low fat milk and yogurts, they are good carbs as long as they are low fat as they, because they come with the protein section also. And we will discuss the portion sizes later in the few slides. But the general guideline is allowing yourself around about three serving of carbohydrates per meal. Now, this is what I was talking about for the portion sizes. Um, the examples that would be one serving of grain or starches might be like one slice of bread, half a cup of pasta, or one third cup of rice. Then in the fruit section, one serving of fruit could be one small apple or pear, half a banana, I know the bananas these days, the, the big size, so we always say half a banana. 
and then a cup of pineapple chunks, a cup of berries. These are the serving sizes based on how many grams of carbohydrates are in each food. So one serving is approximately 15 carbohydrates. And milk servings are only 12 grams of carbs and are also rich in protein. So you can have more than one portion as long as you're mindful that one portion, one serving is 15 grams of carbohydrates and the milk part, milk is 12 grams of carbohydrates. Um, so here is the example of carbohydrates that you should be limiting to because these are refined carbohydrates which will raise your blood glucose quicker than the whole grains because they don't have any fiber in them. So they are all empty calories, meaning that they provide calories and contribute to weight gain. But at the same time, they provide no benefits such as fiber or antioxidants. So the examples here are the sweetened, sugar sweetened beverages, soda, the sweet tea, or even the refined grains like the white bread, sugary cereals, sweet and snack foods would be the cake, the cookies, the candies, and the chips. They only cause the spikes in blood sugar. They have been associated with obesity and contain no fiber. So for example, a classic example would be a bagel. One bagel would be equal to four or six slices of bread, which rises the blood sugar so quickly. So you have to be mindful when going for the refined grains and staying away from them and going for the whole grain food items. Here again, this is an example where it shows, give you a good picture of all the soft drinks or the sweetened beverages that uh, we usually consume during the whole day or um, during our meals. So water and diet soda, Water contains no sugar and uh, compared to the, any sweetened beverages. And also the diet soda has uh, the artificial sweeteners. They taste sweet, but it has no sugar. So it does not raise the blood sugar as much as compared to the Sprite or Fanta or any other. So, so in this example, a Coca-Cola bottle that has about 15 teaspoons of sugar. Now, Showing this another picture here would also help you visualize. So one can of soda is what is in the first cup on the left here. That's the amount of sugar that is there in the one can of soda. So if you're consuming multiple cans during the day, it's about half a cup, half a glass of sugar that you're putting in your body. And one can of soda may seem insignificant, but it adds up so fast. So over the week, uh, period of one week, that one glass of sugar is what you're putting into your body. So it's, it's just a good visual to give you um, a thought that what you're putting in your body is the amount of sugar. This, this here graph gives another example where Betty was talking to you about the good range, healthy range of um, blood sugar. The green dotted line is where you want to be constantly throughout the day. So the blue line in the graph shows you, you can, by consuming whole grains, the veggies and the legumes with high fiber is what is going to keep you in that good range. Meanwhile, if you consume sugary foods or uh, the refined food items, it spikes up your blood sugar so quick and then in no time, like if you see on the graph, it brings you down very quickly, which is not good for you. So, and even the yellow food items. So this picture also shows you the red graph, the red line is that when you consume the red food items from the blue bullseye food graph. Um, so you want to constant, consistently be in that green, between the green dotted line. So in order to control the blood sugar, it is important to consume consistent amount of good quality carbs 
at each meal. This will help you to keep the blood glucose levels and avoid going to the highs and the lows. So just to recap our discussion of carbohydrate food and how it fits in place of the bullseye food guide, um, we should be consuming the greens, the fresh fruit or the frozen fruit. So the fruit in the green zone or are more beneficial than those in the red zone. The fresh fruit in the green zone contain beneficial fiber. They tend to be less processed. And the fruit cups in the, and the juices in the red zone, they contain added sugars and can be over processed. So processed foods in the red zone may digest faster and accelerate the increase of blood sugars in the system. The grains and starches in the green zone usually do not contain unnecessary added sugars as the items in the yellow and the red zone. And so also the milk and the yogurt in the green zone that you see are plain and they tend to not contain added sugars, whereas the red zone will be higher in fat and sugars, which we want to avoid. We'll move on to the non-starchy vegetables now. And these are the important part of everyone's diet. So the non-starchy vegetables have a lot of fiber and very little carbohydrates, which results in smaller impact on your blood sugar. So you want to aim to get at least five servings per day. So you want to incorporate more of the lettuce, the cucumbers, the peppers, the tomatoes, and the green beans. And if you are buying the canned vegetables, it is okay, but look for the low sodium variety and try to avoid the fried vegetables. So one serving, as I was uh, explaining earlier too, so one serving of vegetables is about half cup of cooked vegetables or one cup of raw vegetables. Now let's uh, move on to the protein part on the bullseye food guide. The leaner and higher quality proteins in the green zone can assist us with weight management. The red zone proteins are going to be higher in fat and some highly processed um, and are added sodium and preservatives. So if you go for the frankfurters and the sausages and the lunch on meat, it, that's what is considered the red zone. Um, and you always want to choose the ones in the green area, the beans, the lentils. Uh, this is a better example where it shows you the healthier choices, the green zone items of protein. We have plant protein and animal protein and proteins help slow down the blood sugar increase when eaten with carbohydrates. They're also important for maintaining the lean and muscle mass. So always pick lean cuts of meat and avoid the processed meat that is high in saturated fats. So the beans, the tofu, the lentils, you also have to be mindful of the portion sizes because the beans lentils are considered starches. And the eggs, the chicken, turkey, fish is what you would go for and avoid the sausages and bacon. Now let's move on to the fats. The fats, so avoid the saturated fats and the trans fats, which includes um, the the mayonnaise, the bacon, the coconut oil. Always try to include the healthy fats like the mono or the saturated fats like the avocado oil, nuts, nut butter, fatty fish like salmon and um, the sea. So this is another example put in words here. Fats that you want to avoid are the ones in the green red section uh, butter, 
skin on the poultry, baked goods. Try to incorporate more of the nuts, avocado oil, fatty fish, as I mentioned, the salmon, sardines, and tuna. But you have to be mindful with the sardines and tuna if you're getting from those the pan ones. Try to go for the low sodium ones and those that are in the water instead of the oil ones. And flax seeds and flaxseed oil is another good option for healthy fats. Um, so this puts everything, this diagram puts everything together, which shows how blood sugar responds to carbohydrates, protein, and fat. So people with diabetes, they should never eat carbs by themselves due to the spike in the blood sugar. So example, don't eat, um, it's a, it, try to avoid eating piece of fruit as a snack, but have a piece of fruit with some peanut butter. Another example would be avoid eating just crackers incorporate that cheese, which brings the healthy fats with it. So when you add protein and fat, it slows down the blood sugar response with the carbohydrates. So now, next we will discuss the tips for building a healthy meal, which Jessica is gonna go over. Okay, so now that we've discussed the different types of foods, we can build a healthy meal using the plate method, reading the food label, and being mindful of your portion sizes. The plate method. So what is the plate method? The plate method shown here is a nine inch plate. Here size does matter. Lots of plates in the normal household these days are larger than nine inches. Sometimes they're 10 to 12 inches. If you opt for larger plates, you're going to probably add more food to them. So the nine inch plate is appropriate here. Here you'll see that the vegetables take up half of the plate. So those vegetables can be like a side salad and maybe some steamed broccoli. The next thing is the protein. That takes up about a quarter of the plate. You wanna opt for lean proteins and fish. The other quarter of the plate is going to be made up of your fiber containing grains and starches. Some tips to consider while eating your meal. Eat your protein and veggies first. Protein helps get us full and can prevent us from overeating. Take your time when you're eating. Chew your food well and be mindful of your meal. Take in the scent. Chew well. Once you've finished your meal, allow yourself 20 minutes before determining if you are still hungry. If you feel the need to get more food, opt for those vegetables or the protein rather than the grains and starches that'll raise your blood sugar. Portion sizes. So here we have a slide that shows using hands as a tool of measurement. Most of us don't walk around carrying a set of measuring tools. So using your hand is a great alternative. The first one here is an open hand and that's the equivalent to your, to your um, protein portion. So that equals about three ounces. So that would be your beefs, your chickens, your fish. And then over to the left here, we have a closed fist. This is the size of about a cup. And that could be used to determine how much rice, fruits, or vegetables you're consuming. On the bottom left of the screen, you have an index finger. That would be equal to about an ounce. And that would be your cheese's portion size. Over here is the thumb and that equals about two tablespoons. That is a good measurement of peanut butter. Also here is a closed fist. This one just looks at the fingers closed. This is about a half a cup for rice and pasta. 
And then up in the upper right corner here is a cupped hand, and that's about an ounce, and that would be for your nuts and dried fruit portion size. This is another slide that uses hands and common everyday items to measure the food. So here you have meat, which would be about the same as before as uh, the palm of your hand. It's also measured as a deck of cards. Here you have pasta that's measured as a half a cup would be equal to about a tennis ball. And then another common one would be fish, that's about three ounces and that's equal to the size of a checkbook. Um, another one that's important is the tip of your thumb, which would be about a teaspoon. That would be like a fat such as butter. And then this one here is a bagel, which is the size of a hockey puck. And that also is about the size of the palm of your hand. Regular plain bagels should fit in the palm of your hand and not be the size of the ones that you get from Costco and delis. Those are, those are huge. Okay, on to reading a food label. So on packaged goods such as breads, crackers, cereals, you'll see that there's a nutrition facts label. Understanding how to read a nutrition facts label is important. You'll see the top line here, which is highlighted in blue, will show you the amounts of servings per container, as well as what a serving size of that item is. So in this case, it's one cup. The next line, highlighted in pink, shows the amount of calories. This is the amount of calories that's in one serving of this food. In this case, that's 280 calories for one cup. Underneath the calories are the other nutrients involved. We have total fat here for one serving is nine grams, and then it also shows the saturated fat. It also has the cholesterol and the sodium, and then it also shows the total carbohydrates in the serving. So in this case, there's 34 grams of carbohydrates in one cup of this food. Also, in those carbohydrates, four of them, four grams, are considered fiber. You'll also see six grams of sugars here, and added sugars will be noted. And then underneath that shows the protein per, per serving, which is 15 grams in this case. Say you only had a half a serving. A half a serving would be a half a cup in this case. You would then divide all these numbers in half. So a half a cup would end up being 140 calories, about four and a half grams of fat, and about 17 grams of carbs for a half a cup of serving. So what does a sample meal plan look for someone with type 2 diabetes? We still want it to be a well-balanced well meal with consistent carbohydrates at each meal with lean protein and healthy fats. Meal timing is important. That's not to say that these times here are specifically designed for you. It's important to note that this meal plan should be individualized to each person, including preferences, allergies, and caloric needs. So it's important to allow enough time in between meals to help allow our blood glucose to return to normal levels. However, we also don't wanna to wait too long in between meals and risk hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. If we take a look at the breakfast, you'll note that there's two slices of whole grain toast. That's our fiber containing carbohydrate. You'll also note that it's paired with scrambled eggs. It's important to pair your carbohydrate containing foods along with a protein so as not to raise your blood glucose too high. You'll also note here that there's eight ounces of unsweetened green tea 
cooked spinach for the added veggies and avocado for the healthy fats. At lunchtime, we're opting for a sandwich here with, with two slices of whole grain bread and chicken, chicken being the protein paired with the carbohydrate. We're also including an apple, which is another carbohydrate and water, seltzer water. In another four hours, we're eating a cup of rice paired with three ounces of salmon, again, with the pairing of the protein and the carbohydrate with broccoli and cauliflower, and again, water. If you wish to include a snack, make sure that you're incorporating the same theory with the protein and carbohydrate pairing. Exercise is also another component of helping manage diabetes. According to the American Diabetes Association, regular exercise is recommended to help with the control of diabetes. So why exercise with diabetes? Well, diabetes can be helpful because when you're physically active, your cells actually become more sensitive to insulin. This means that the insulin can work more effectively, which in turn helps lower blood glucose levels. And then muscles that have been trained or exercised will increase the capacity to use fats and carbohydrates. Some of the benefits noted here in the pictures of exercise show that endorphins and neurotransmitters are released to help improve your mood. It helps decrease your blood pressure to improve heart function. You'll gain stronger muscles, and it will also help with weight loss, which is, which is associated with a reduction in the risk of type 2 diabetes. So even losing 7% of your weight if you have prediabetes, that can reduce your risk of that turning into type 2 diabetes. So setting exercise goals. We have aerobic activity that we can do and strength training that we can do. For aerobic exercise, that's important for heart health and for weight loss. You want to aim for three days a week for 20 to 60 minutes each day. You can do those in 10 minute increments if you feel like it. <coughs> you can do 10 minutes in the morning and say 20 minutes in the evening. If you're looking for weight loss, five to six days a week of aerobic activity would help. Some examples of aerobic activity include walking, running, dancing, cycling, and using the elliptical machine. Strength training over here on the right-hand side is important for gaining muscle. You wanna aim for eight to 10 exercises three times per week. That includes lifting weights and doing lunges. This can be incorporated into your daily living. Say if you're watching TV, you can have your weights right there and do a couple of exercises, or even when you're cooking dinner, waiting for your pasta to boil. Remember to start slow and increase over time. You don't wanna overdo it in the first day and cause injury. Also, it's important to consult your doctor prior to starting any exercise regimen. Light walking is a great place to start. Okay. So you don't have to join an expensive gym to get your exercise in. It can be easy and free. There's many different resources that you can use, including the American Diabetes Association website, which has different exercise and fitness guidelines. YouTube also can be used to look for exercise videos that are catered to your skill level. There's also apps you can download onto your smartphone. <coughs> These include Nike Training Club, Couch to 5K, Swerk It, and Daily Yoga, and Better Me, to name a few. Many smartphones also now have activity trackers already on, installed in them for people to utilize. So let's take a little time to do an activity if you want to grab a pen and some paper. 
we're going to set small attainable goals using the goal ladder. So we want to be specific about our goals. We want to be realistic and actual attainable goals. So we want to do a nutrition goal as well as an exercise goal. And then identify barriers that may prevent you from achieving that goal and strategies to overcome those barriers. So I'll give you a few minutes to work on some goals for yourself. If you want to take some time and come up with a nutrition goal for yourself that comes with barriers and strategies, as well as an exercise goal with barriers and strategies. All right, so we've come up with a couple of uh, goals as an example. A nutrition goal that we came up with is to eat a balanced breakfast every morning of a workday week. That would be a non-fat plain Greek yogurt with a tablespoon of peanut butter and a piece of fruit. Again, you can see the pairing of the protein and the carbohydrate. A barrier that comes along with that goal is that you may tend to wake up too late to eat breakfast before work. A strategy to overcome that barrier would be to in include um, packing a cooler the night before, put it in the fridge, and then grab it on your way to work so you can eat breakfast at work. A goal for exercise could be to walk your dog for 20 minutes five days a week right after work. A barrier to that goal would be that you come home from work and start doing chores around the house or watch TV. A strategy to overcome that barrier will, could be that you set your sneakers aside by the door as a reminder to go right outside when you get home from work to go for that walk. Awesome, thank you. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and go through and see how we did as a group. Upala, if you can switch to the next slide. Oh. We can go through it here. Does everyone see the polls question showed up on their screen here? The poll answers? There you go. Okay, wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the first question is, which of the following is not a carbohydrate? So hopefully, as you learn from this presentation, peas are considered a starchy vegetable, so they are considered carbs. An apple is a fruit, which is also considered a carbohydrate. And pasta is also considered a starch. So chicken is the only one here that's considered a protein and doesn't really give any carbohydrates. So the next question is, what is the best meal pattern to manage diabetes? So as we talked about with the meal plan, we really want consistent carbohydrate, lean protein, and healthy fats. Um, another key point was to never eat carbohydrate alone. So the next question was, which beverage will cause your blood sugar to raise the highest? So as we had mentioned from the think your drink picture, um, diet soda, may taste sweet, but it has artificial sweetener, so it's not sugar, so it won't raise your blood sugar as high as, say, a regular can of soda will. And water and seltzer don't typically have any sugar. Next question was, which hormone helps lower blood sugar? And the answer to that question is insulin. That's the hormone that our pancreas releases in response to high blood glucose levels to help us absorb and use that glucose so that we can use it for energy. So the next question was, a healthy plate consists of, and this is what we were referring to with the plate that Jessica brought us through, 
on the nine inch plate and how we really want to have a quarter plate of grains, a quarter plate of protein, and half your plate being fruits or vegetables. Next question was, which of the following is a normal fasting blood sugar level when you haven't eaten anything? So as we had mentioned, a normal fasting blood sugar level is less than 100. But we had also spoken about the risk of hypoglycemia, which is when our blood sugars get too low. So that's why less than 50 is not an appropriate answer to this question. For number seven, it's what is the portion size of protein? So as Jessica had showed us and walked us through how to use our hands when we don't have any measuring tools, and the appropriate size for protein may be the palm of your hand. And the last question was, which foods are not allowed for individuals with diabetes? And fruit, vegetables, and grains and starches were the choices. They all give carbohydrates, but they're all part of a healthy meal plan for everyone, including those with diabetes, as long as you're really choosing the right choices from, for example, the bullseye food guide and really doing your best to choose from the green and the yellow sections. So we've gone through our presentation um, we have our contact information on the next slide if you ever need to contact us. And at this time, we encourage you to, if you want to participate, ask a question, you can unmute yourself and do that. And we'll also address the questions from the chat box. All right. So the first question in the chat box that came in is a breakfast cereal like Fiber One that has no added sugar safe for pre-diabetics? I think Paul had to leave us. He put this question in here. Um, it depends on the cereal. Um, Jessica and Upala, if you want to speak in on this, please do. Um, fiber one with no added sugar is a better option than say something like Lucky Charms or Apple Jacks, which is really all sugar. Um, so fiber one is really known for having fiber, which is really great in helping us control our blood sugar. So it's not the worst option. Um, and if you're having it with milk, there is some protein in the milk. So there is some carbohydrate and protein pairing, which is good. Um, Jessica and Upala, do you have anything to add for that? Uh, and I would just add that you always have to be mindful of the portion sizes. Um, although it says, the cereal says the fiber is good, always be mindful with the portion sizes that we uh, serve ourselves. And um, as Jessica had mentioned, the um, one cup, and the serving, reading the labels will also help you. So that's what I would say. Absolutely. Next question was, what if you don't want to lose weight, but just maintain a healthy level of glucose? So this is a great question and it's hard to answer because everybody's body is so different. So, you know, if you're exercising and eating healthy and you're maintaining a healthy weight, you won't continue to lose weight if you're eating the right foods. Um, but again, being mindful of the carbohydrates and the added sugars in your diet can really help keep your glucose in a healthy range. Um, Paula and Jessica, do you have anything? I was just going to say too, with consistent carbohydrate intake, so having about two to three carbs or 15 gram carb servings, so two to three of those at each meal, that should also help you maintain a healthy level. Absolutely. We don't want anyone to cut out carbs from their diet. That's like a huge uh, misconception. I think we see sometimes in the community with diabetes is that carbs aren't really good to have and that's not true at all. It's just making the right choices, the fibers, whole grains and being mindful of portion sizes. Okay, another question. Um, are nutritional protein drinks such as blue, boost glucose control effective? Upala, Jessica, do you wanna chime in? So with these drinks, they're fine to consume. It's just that they're not, so you're, they're more of a meal replacement. Like if you're not eating, say, breakfast and lunch, we would rather you eat something. But if you're not going to, those are okay options to consume. And again, you have to be mindful with the um, reading the label, the amount of uh, added sugar if you can look at that, and the carbohydrates on the label, if it says. So you, you have to be considering how, many, how much carbohydrates or added sugar are you adding to yourself? And are you having that boost uh, glucose control in addition to your meal? Or is it just as a meal? So that all these factors come into play when you're adding something new or 
the amount of um, additional meals that you're adding to. Right. And I think with the meal substitutes, the drinks, um, boost would be better than something like an insure, which may have a lot of sugar. The boost glucose control is made for individuals with diabetes. So it would be a better option than say another one with more sugar. Okay, so yes, this presentation will be recorded and shared. Um, so you can access it later on if you want, if you wanna revisit. Um, and then we have another question here for what are some good snack suggestions? So again, I would suggest pairing your carbohydrates with protein. So you could opt for a piece of fruit, but you also want to have it with some type of protein. And that could be, say, peanut butter, or you could opt for um, crackers and cheese, uh, vegetable sticks, and maybe some like a Greek yogurt dip. Hummus. Hummus oh, hummus great. is good. Too. Hummus is great because there's a chocolate flavored hummus now too that you could use for like apple slices, which is great too. So these would be some of the, and uh, Betty, if you can think of anything you can add on too. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the most important thing is just remembering to pair your carbohydrates with proteins at snack time. So like a Greek yogurt's a great example with some fruit and some nuts you know, really trying to think of the main takeaways when you sit down for a snack. Like you ideally don't want to go and snack on a big bag of chips or something, like really be mindful of your portion size. And for maybe foods in the red groups, really stop and think like, do I really need this as my snack? Um, and then another question is what's a normal A1C level? So um, from a refresher from the beginning, um, typically a normal A1C level is less than 5.7%. Um, when you're in the 5.7 to 6.4.5 range, it's typically pre-diabetes. And then if it's greater than 6.5, it's typically indicative of a diabetes diagnosis. But this is something that your doctor would discuss with you um, once they got your blood, your blood work done. Okay, and we have one last question here. Should we take metformin medicine or better to have control by the diet? She wants to know the side effects of metformin. So this is really a question more for your primary care physician or your endocrinologist if you see them. Um, it's not really in our realm as dietitians to make recommendations for medication, but I think, I mean, our dream goal is to have you really be cautious with your diet, getting a good amount of exercise so that you don't need the medication. Um, Jessica Upala, if you have anything to add. No, I think, um more of the metformin as you cleared it up, it's uh, more of the endocrinologist or your physician would be advisable to talk to him about that. Um, but in addition to that, if you do um, follow the guidelines for the diet, it would help definitely. All right. Are there any other questions from anyone? We thank you so much for joining us and if you have questions, you could always reach out to the contact information that was on the last slide. And you can always go back to the presentations when it's, uh, once it's been uh, posted. Thank you guys. Thank you.